divine inspiration of prophecy fulfilled. This is from the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. And leaving Nazareth, he, Jesus, came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the borders of Zebulon and Nepithalam. Those were tribes, uh, part of the original 12 tribes. And then with the Levite tribe, uh, that makes 13. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, that's Isaiah, the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulon and the land of Nippethelon, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region in shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's from Matthew. Now I'm going to show you what, what just happened here. There's no prophecy. There's no prophecy. And Jesus is not in it. It's got nothing to do with Jesus going to live in Capernaum. This is what it's about. It's about the northern kingdom in chapter 8. And then in chapter 9 it's about the southern kingdom. And there's no prophecy in it. And he, he, he combined those two. This is what the verse actually says from chapter 8, verse 23. For if there were to be any break of day for the land which is in straits, okay, Assyria was defeating them and deporting them. The land was in straits long before Jesus was born. Only the former king would have brought a basement to the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. While the latter one would have brought honor to the way of the sea, the other side of the Jordan, and Galilee of the nations. Okay, this is not a prophecy to be fulfilled. It has nothing to do with Jesus. It is more of plagiarism altered to fit Jesus into the Hebrew Bible. This is a statement in the last verse of chapter 8 concerning the coming defeat of the northern kingdom of Samaria, also called the kingdom of Israel and sometimes Ephraim, by the Assyrians. That ends chapter 8 regarding the northern kingdom, and then chapter 9 begins regarding the southern kingdom of Judah, and an exaltation of the birth of King Hezekiah of Judah in the southern kingdom. That's the great light. And this is how it reads. The people that walked in darkness have seen a brilliant light on those who dwelt in a land of gloom. Light has dawned. You have magnified that nation, have given it great joy. They have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at reaping time, as they exult when dividing the spoil. This is all addressed to God. For the yoke that they bore, and the stick on their back, the rod of their taskmaster, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Truly, all of the boots put on to stamp with, and all the garments donned in infamy have been fed to the flames, devoured by fire. For a child has been born to us. A son has been given us. And authority has settled on his shoulders. This is King Hezekiah. He becomes king. He has been named the mighty God as planning grace. The eternal father, a peaceable ruler. That's Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. This is from 2 Kings. Chapter 17, verse 6. In the ninth year of Hoshi, the king of Assyria captures Samaria. 
he de deported the Israelites to Assyria and set them in Hala, at the river Habor, at the river Gaza, and in the towns of Medea, which would be Iran. This is from 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 24 through 35. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutta, Ava, Hamath, and Sipharim, and he settled them in the towns of Samaria in place of the Israelites. These are imported Gentiles in the northern kingdom. They took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its towns. This is why when the exiles of Babylon and Assyria were released uh, by decree of Cyrus the Great, that they only returned to Judah and Benjamin. Benjamin is where the kings rule from for Judah, and it's considered part of Judah. But that's why they didn't return to the northern kingdom. And from that, somebody decided the northern kingdom tribes must have got lost. No, <laughs> just, there was Gentiles there. They, these Gentiles even tried to stop the building of the second temple. The Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1 is an exaltation of the birth of King Hezekiah of Judah in the southern kingdom. Because the Assyrians were now threatening Judah, which is why there was a great exaltation of the birth of, of Hezekiah. This is not a prophecy of Jesus dwelling in Capernaum and that a great light has been seen by the people living there with Jesus, beginning the preaching of repentance. Jesus has nothing to do with these verses. It is about kingdoms and kings defeating and deporting the Jewish people and importing Gentiles to the northern kingdom in chapter 8. And in chapter 9, the hope that the newborn heir to the throne in the southern kingdom of Judah would be a great king, graced by God, to lead Judah as a peaceable ruler in dangerous times. One verse is about the northern kingdom, and the next verse in a new chapter is about the southern kingdom. Nothing about prophecy. These are just an announcements and a speech to God. The verses have nothing to do with one another or with Jesus. Verses of the Hebrew Bible, which is the Old Testament and the Holy Bible, lifted out and made a part of the Gospel of Matthew with the words that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah didn't make a prophecy. It's not in there. The story of Jesus has nothing to do with the Hebrew Bible. The writer of Matthew tells his readers a prophecy has been fulfilled by Jesus and combines two verses, changing, changing their meaning and context, and includes an act of Jesus to make it seem as though Jesus was in the, quote, prophecy. That the prophecy of Isaiah includes Jesus preaching repentance. From the days of the writings of the New Testament through the Middle Ages, the world was illiterate for the most part, and very few people had access to the Hebrew Bible or could read the Greek translation of it, later translated to English. No one could examine the veracity of the unknown writers of the Gospels and determine if a prophecy was really fulfilled and relied on religious leaders' assertions that they were written by divine inspiration. There is nothing divine about this passage in the book of Matthew. It is intentionally written to mislead the reader. Today, there is a complete new translation of the Hebrew Bible into English that is far superior to the Hebrew to Greek to English of the Old Testament. They make it much easier to understand and read. It's the Jewish Publication Society, 1985 to Nock, which was not based on any writings before it. They started from scratch in 1955. Complete new. Here, and, and, and this is after Israel had adopted Hebrew as one of the two uh, languages of that nation, uh, the other being Arab. So they spent about 30 years on it. And they, 
they, they had a rabbi from each of the, uh, uh, from Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform, and uh, uh, men who spent their whole life working on translations as uh, professors of college, le very learned men. All Christians have the ability today to see that the story of Jesus has nothing to do with the Hebrew Bible, that the prophecy fulfilled verses of the New Testament, which is full of them, especially Matthew. I, I challenge anybody, go, go run down yourself. Usually he doesn't tell you who the prophet is. You have to go find it. And when you find it, you're going to find it's not prophecy or, or, or it's been altered. There's about 15 of them. It starts on the first page. And I'm going to have a video on that uh, real soon in the uh, um, this whole story about a virgin having a baby. That's what it's going to center on. And you'll be surprised. Thank you for listening.